Welcome to Common Grounds, a connect group of Sagemont Church in Houston, Texas. In today's lesson, we're going through a study of Jeremiah, God's heart in troubled times. And now, for today's lesson. All right, good morning. Jeremiah chapter 1. We are finishing up chapter 1 today. Uh, we have looked so far at his time period, what was going on in Israel's history. Uh, the southern tribe of Judah is getting ready to be exiled, deported to Babylon because of their sin. They have turned away from the Lord. God calls this young man named Jeremiah to be his prophet, to speak for him. Uh, but before Jeremiah can speak to the people, he has to hear from God. So he hears from God in the beginning of chapter 1, and God tells him, I formed you, I created you, I consecrated you, I set you up part and you're going to go speak for me. He says, I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. And God tells him, don't worry about that. Don't be afraid of the people I'm sending you to. Just go speak. And starting with verse 9, it says, the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see an almond branch. And the Lord said to me, you have seen correctly, for I am watching over my word to perform it. And the word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, what do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. Then the Lord said to me, out of the north disaster shall be set loose upon all the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the tribes of the kingdoms of the north, declares the Lord, and they, plural, shall come and everyone shall set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem against all its walls all around and against all the cities of Judah. And I will declare my judgments against them for all their evil in forsaking me. They have made offerings to other gods and worship the works of their own hands. But you, get yourself ready, arise, and say to them everything I command you. Do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. And behold, I have made you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar, and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. Father, thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for your truth. I pray that you would guide my mind and my thoughts as I teach today, Lord. And I pray that you would speak through me. Speak to our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Open our eyes to see wonderful things from your law. We are totally dependent upon you, Lord, to understand your word. So we pray that you would speak to us today and change us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so Jeremiah, we're going to pick up with verse 9 here. He reaches out his hand and touches Jeremiah. Listen, there is nothing like a touch from the Lord. There is nothing like it. We need God. God to touch our lives. We need God to minister to us. And he says, I put my words in your mouth. He touches his mouth. Uh, before we can be used by God, we need to get near God. And I think the closer you get to God, the more you will be used by God. He must speak to you first before you go speak to others. Verse 10 is very interesting. He tells Jeremiah, Jeremiah, this day, today I've set you over nations and kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy, overthrow, to build and to plant. Now, we know that God is over kingdoms and nations, right? I mean, the Lord is over all. He can do whatever he wants with the nations of the world. They are his. They belong to him. He will judge them collectively and individually. So there's a day coming and even in throughout history, God judges nations. That's clear. It's clear in the Old Testament. It's clear throughout history that God makes people pay for their sin. He raises up nations. He makes them great, and then he destroys them. He can do whatever he wants. But here it says, Jeremiah, I have put you over nations. Now, this is interesting. What does that mean? That Jeremiah, this young man, probably a teenager, is being put over nations. What does that mean? Well, uh, first of all, I think you can understand here from the scripture, Old and New Testament, that we have tremendous spiritual authority. When we come to Christ, he gives us spiritual authority. Think about it. Now, we are citizens of the United States. I am not into bashing the United States. I love my country. I've taught its history for 20 years. But have we ever really gotten it right? I mean, are we really spiritual citizens of the United States? Some people think they are. 
but you're really not. The Bible says your citizenship is in heaven. I mean, think about this country. I, I'm going to talk negatively about it for a little bit because there's a lot of idol worship of our country, even in the church. First of all, for our first 200 plus years, we had slavery. While we're celebrating our own freedom, some of the men who celebrated their own freedom had slaves in the backyard and in the house. Okay, we got rid of that with a civil war, and it took a civil war. It took a horrible war. We got rid of it, right? Well, it's back again in human trafficking. But then after that, you've got 100 years of segregation and racism, horrible racism. Well, we finally kind of fixed that somewhat in the civil rights movement in the 1960s, 100 years after the civil war. And then a whole nation turns us back on God. And the 1960s starts the American rebellion, and we've got three generations now, grandparents, parents, and kids who have rebelled against the Lord. Um, they've killed 50 million unborn children. They're into alcohol and drugs. They're into all kinds of things that don't matter. They waste their time. They don't love the Lord. They don't come to church. They promote all kinds of lifestyles that are deviant from the word of God. They're in rebellion to the Lord. When have we ever gotten it right? in this country. You and I are not spiritual citizens of the United States. We are spiritual citizens of the kingdom of heaven. God tells Jeremiah, you are over these nations and kingdoms. These nations and kingdoms are corrupt. Jeremiah, I'm placing you over them. Now, Jesus told us to go into all the world, all the nations, and preach the good news because God loves the people of the nations, right? How can he tell us to do that? Because he said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Jesus said. Jesus has authority over all the kingdoms and all the nations. So therefore, since they belong to me and I have power over them, I'm telling you to go into them. But what about the ones that won't let us in? Doesn't matter to Jesus. He said, go. Find a way to go. Be wise as a serpent. Be innocent as a dove. We say in our country, oh, there's certain places we can't share the gospel. That's not true. All authority has been given to Jesus. You just need to be wise about how you do it. Wise as a serpent and innocent as a dove, Jesus said. But all the nations belong to him and he has told us to go to them. Now, I don't think this means we go to around the world and don't go across the street or don't go down the block or don't go to our own city. We're going everywhere, right? Not just across the world, but we are to go across the world as the Lord leads, but we'll also go to the city of Houston. We are missionaries to the city of Houston. Only our kingdom, the kingdom of God, will last forever. This nation we live in will not last forever. Our kingdom does not have a shelf life. The kingdom we build, the kingdom we're in, the kingdom we're a citizen of, that we work in, is going to last forever. And what we do for that kingdom really matters. That's when we're making a big difference. I believe in serving our country. I believe in serving our fellow citizens. Lots of wonderful people that have done that in our country for the Lord's glory throughout its history. We've had a lot of Christians in our country. Our country's done a lot of great things, but it's not forever. Our kingdom is going to last forever, the kingdom of God. Now, let's talk about Jesus and his rule of the nations. Revelation 1, verse 5 and 6. He is described as Jesus Christ the ruler of the kings of the earth. When? Right now. Right now, Jesus Christ is the ruler of the kings of the earth. They are there because he has given them permission to be there. He is the ruler. He can take their breath away at any moment. He can take away their power, their authority. He is the ruler, and he's going to judge them for how they ruled. The rest of those verses say, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. That's good news. He loves us, and he's freed us from our sins by his blood and check this out made us a kingdom he made us a kingdom and priest to his god and father he's made us two things here he's made us a kingdom and he's made us priest all of us we are priests of the lord inside this kingdom what does that mean well we minister we offer up sacrifices we we bless people we share the gospel with people we are all that's the priesthood of the believer we are all priests inside of this kingdom according to the word of God, all believers. So we need to teach people how to act like a priest inside the kingdom. Now think about this as an Old Testament priest, not a Roman Catholic priest. It's a big difference. Or not a pastor. This is not talking about a pastor. This is talking about priest of the Lord serving in his kingdom. Think about that. Dwell on that. Ask the Lord what that means for you, that your identity is that you are a priest to the Lord. Ephesians 2, 6. God has raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Woo! Meditate on that. God has raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So this is what Ephesians 2 says, and we're studying Ephesians in our, in our large group worship service. Because we belong to Christ and we are a part of him, we are also in him. And where is he at? He is seated at the right hand of God. He is on the throne, and he has placed us there spiritually. Do you believe that? So we walk around sometimes like we're, we've got this identity crisis. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. We have been 
been given tremendous spiritual authority over the nations in a way? Yes, if we're seated with him. Look, I know we're concerned for our country. A lot of people are, but don't let it get to you. It's a temporary place. We're not to be under this country. We have a heavenly citizenship. We're to pray for it, bless it, win people to Christ, but don't be despaired by it. Take your prayers to the Lord. We got work to do inside of his kingdom. God has not called us to fix America. He's called us to save people, to minister to people, to love people. You understand? We got to get above this. We're, we're serving a different kingdom. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. That is tremendous spiritual authority. Meditate on what that means. We walk around looking down, thinking down of ourselves when it actually we are in a spiritually powerful place. When we pray, we pray in faith, we trust the Lord, we follow his spirit. This is Ephesians 2 is powerful. Meditate on it as we get ready to study it. Revelation 2 26. Jesus speaks to the church at Thyatira and says, To the one who overcomes, and does my will to the end, I will give him authority over the nations. Future tense. So right now, spiritually, we're seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. And Jesus said, if you overcome the world, your sin, and you do my will to the very end, you persevere, I'm going to give you authority over the nation. Wow. A lot of people see this as the millennial reign of Christ. When Jesus comes back to the earth and reigns for a thousand years on the earth, literally from Jerusalem. My point here is that we have a powerful position in Jesus Christ. When we've been saved and we've been called into him, we've been given spiritual authority and spiritual power. We need to exercise it. We need to pray. We need to, to recognize who we are in the Lord. God can hear our prayers. Our prayers can reach into the White House, the Congress, anywhere in the whole world. And we have, with Christ, power in him and authority in him. I love my country, but God has in a sense given me some authority that is somewhat over it. And listen to what I'm saying here. I respect our country. I obey its laws. But when its laws or its ideas contradict the word of God, I disobey it. It's not my first allegiance. It's not where my spiritual citizenship is. God tells Jeremiah, I'm placing you over nations and kingdoms, plural. Do you know Jeremiah just doesn't prophesy to Israel? He actually prophesies, I counted about 13 different nations. God is going to get all these nations. He's stirring up the world. He's raising up Babylon. Why is God doing this to the nations at that time? because of their sin. Have we seen in world history times of great calamity in the nations and things like that? We have. 13 different nations at least. Maybe more he prophesies over. I counted about, thir about 13. But Jeremiah is not just prophesying about Israel. He's talking about Egypt. He's talking about what's going to happen to Babylon too after they get done because he's going to hold them accountable as well. So the Lord is over the nations and since the Lord is over the nations, he can put Jeremiah over the nations if he chooses to. Verse 10. There are four destructive terms and two constructive terms. The destructive terms are you're going to pluck down, break down, destroy, and overthrow. Pluck up. Constructive terms are you're going to build and you're going to plant. Now, Jeremiah will see more destruction during his time, during his life, than building things up. But the whole point of destroying things is not just to destroy them. It's to rebuild them. Doesn't God have to do that with us, too, in our lives? Doesn't he have to destroy things in our lives and let things die in our life before he rebuilds us? Every time I've gone to a different ministry, it seems like things just got crushed and destroyed in my heart before he rebuilt it. So if you're in that destructive phase right now, that's because he's got some construction plan for you. Remember that? He says, I, I prune you, not to kill you, but so that you will bear more fruit in the future. And every time I've shifted ministries, I've gone through a lot of stuff. Either at the end of that ministry or in the waiting period for the next ministry, and it's always resulted in bearing fruit for the Lord. But you've got to go through that process. And I know at some point in the future, it's coming again. It's just what he does. He tears things down and builds them up in our life so that only Christ is our focus. And he purifies us. He uses the trials of life. He uses the trials of our physical bodies. All kinds of things he uses to fix us and remold us and remake us. He reshapes us. Brokenness. Jonathan Edwards says, Religious affections or religious feelings pour out of a broken heart. When your heart is broken before God, you, you're more tender. You're more loving. You're more compassionate. We shouldn't be afraid of the breaking, of the tears, of the, the spiritual work in our hearts. Some of us need to weep. We need to cry for the lost. We need to cry over our own sin. We need God to break up the hardness of our heart and let those religious, and when he says religious, he means spiritual Christian feelings flow out of our heart. Love and joy and peace and compassion for people. God hasn't called us just to endure people. He's called us to go beyond that and love them. And it's difficult. We can't do it without him. And we can't do it without him working in our lives. Verse 11, the word of the Lord came to me. God speaks to Jeremiah. Ministry begins when God speaks to you. When God starts to speak to you, 
you're going to start speaking to others because you're going to have something to say. You need God to speak to you. You need his word. You need a revelation from him. Even sometimes if he just tells you one word. One night I was praying about going to a certain ministry. I ended up serving there six years in a church. And I was praying about should I be there or not. And in the middle of the night, I heard the Lord say my name audibly. Maybe it was a dream. I don't know. But I heard him say my name loud. So all he said was my name. And I knew exactly what he meant. You go. All he said was Cliff. And it woke me up and I was awake for an hour. He spoke it right over here, right through the wall. And I'm like, he said my name. That's all he said. But I knew what he meant. Go. One word from God can change your life. You need God to speak to you. You need God to speak to you through his word by his spirit. Now, he will never contradict his word when he speaks to you. And you need to test something. I am trying. I am learning throughout my life not to go around and say, God said this and God told me this until I've tested it. In other words, if I feel an impression from the Holy Spirit, like go speak to someone and I do and the Lord opens it up and it's a great ministry, then I will tell people, I felt the Holy Spirit tell me this and I went and did this. I try not to say, God is telling me to do this. He's telling me to go here and do that and marry this person. And do all that. I've been made a fool so many times by not testing things and not waiting on the Lord. So when I, hopefully when you hear, hear me say God's been telling me something or speaking to me, it's kind of after I've tested it for a while. We need to learn to do that. I know people that actually disobeyed the Word of God because they felt the Holy Spirit told them to do something that was contrary to the Word of God. That is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will never contradict the Word of God, ever. Right? That's the devil, or that's your own flesh, or whatever, but it's not the Holy Spirit. We have to test things, especially when you're dealing, dealing with the Holy Spirit. You definitely need to test things. If it's in the Word, oh, well, the Word is true, but you can misinterpret the Word, too. One of our sage Mike counselors said he was talking to a woman, and she says, I just know God's called me to marry this guy. He's like, how? He says, well, I opened up my body. Bible and I asked God to speak to me and it said, behold, your king is coming to you. And he looked at her and said, that's not what this verse is saying. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we need to test everything. And we test that by the body of Christ, by sound wisdom, by seeking the Lord, by waiting on the Lord. And uh, I mean, if you want to look like a fool, go around and tell God told me this, God said this, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Maybe. Many are the plans of a man's heart, but the Lord's purpose is what prevails. So Let's wait on the Lord. God has often given me impressions and thoughts that never came about, or I thought it was the Lord, maybe it was my own heart, or whatever. You have to wait on the Lord. So God does speak to us. No doubt, He wants to speak to you. But just a little word of warning there about how, how to process things, right? He tells Jeremiah, Jeremiah, what do you see? This is good. What do y'all see? What is the Lord showing you? What do you see? Jeremiah says, I see an almond branch. Now, I don't think he sees a vision of this. He could, but I personally think he actually sees an almond branch. The, the, city, the village where he was from, Anatoth, which was three miles north of Jerusalem, uh, had a big almond growing vineyards and things like that. I don't know what you call them vineyards. I don't know what you call them. Almond growing plants, trees, something like that. I'm sorry. I'm a Houston guy. I'm a city guy. Orchard. There you go. Thank you. Orchard. <laughs> So they have this almond orchard, okay, and it's still there today. They say if you travel to that village today, they're still growing almonds there. So he probably, in, in my mind, sees, he's looking at something, and, and the Holy Spirit speaks to him, and God speaks to him, and he says, what do you see? He says, I see an almond branch. And this word for almond is also closely related to the Hebrew word for watching. So the Lord, it's kind of a play on words. And the Lord says to him, you have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. We kind of lose that in the translation a little bit, but it's the exact same consonants, just the vowel points are different in there. It says, Jeremiah, I'm going to call you to go out and speak. And you don't worry about it. You speak my words because I am watching over my word that comes to you to perform it. I'm going to fulfill what you say. Now, what was the penalty in the Old Testament for a prophet who spoke something that didn't come to pass? Do you know? Death penalty. This is, I would think, be pretty comforting to me that God was telling him, I'm going to fulfill the words that I speak through you. So don't be afraid. Go speak. And he's also going to have opposition as well. God tells him, what I tell you, I'm going to bring about. What I have said, I am going to bring about. God is going to fulfill fulfill every verse, every phrase, every single word in the Bible, every single one. God is going to fulfill everything he said in the scriptures. What you feel, what you think, what I think, maybe that's his will, but he's going to do everything he said in the Bible. So let's know it. Let's believe it. Let's count on it. You can bank your life. You can bank your eternity on the word of God. God will also accomplish his will through you. You can rest in that. Sometimes I think, you know, what am I doing here? Is my life uh, have purpose and meaning? I just see these thoughts come through my head. What am I supposed to be doing with my life? And Psalm 138, 8 will come to my mind. Psalm 138, 8 says, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. We can rest in that. 
God is going to use you for his glory, for whatever purpose he has designed for you, and he is going to fulfill it. It's his deal. You're walking in obedience to the Lord. You don't need to worry about anything. It may not be your will for your life, but it's going to be God's will for your life. We need to rest in that and die to our will and trust in his will, but the Lord is going to fulfill his purpose for us. Whatever your ministry is, whatever your mission is, whatever your purpose is, he's going to fulfill it. Nothing is going to stop him from fulfilling the purpose that he created you for. So rest in that. Now, we looked last Sunday at Ephesians and how, in the worship service, how um, God speaks to the, the church and gives them the identity first, right? Identity first and then practical stuff later, like not your identity isn't practical, it's very practical, but actions later, identity first, actions later. God does the same thing to Jeremiah. He tells him who he is. You're a prophet. I've formed you. I've consecrated you. You're my servant. I've created you. You're a pre-planned servant of the Lord. I designed you. You were my idea. And then he tells him what to do. He starts giving him things to do, right? Identity first, action second. Personally, I think the closer we are to the Lord, the more we will understand who we are. Since our identity is bound up in Christ, the less we sin, the closer we get to God, the more we're going to understand who we really are because our identity is wrapped up in Christ. I found that my spiritual gifts flow out more when I'm closer to the Lord. They come to life. When they get covered up in other things, sometimes I don't even know if I have that gift anymore. But as I get closer to Christ, those spiritual gifts start to flow out. So when we are close to the Lord, we will understand who we are. The Bible also says that our full identity will come with the revelation of Christ, that we don't even know who we fully are yet, that we are in process, and we won't fully know who we are on this earth. But our full identity will come with the revelation of Jesus Christ when he returns or when we're with him. That's pretty cool, too, to think about. We're going to be exactly like Christ in character. That's going to be amazing. No more sin. So let the Lord remind you of who you are. Let him remind you. You're my son. You're my daughter. You're not a mistake. I planned you. You're my servant. I've got a purpose for you. I've given you gifts and abilities. I love you so much. I died for you. Don't be so hard on yourself. I'm your God. I'm your, I know you're a sinful. I know you stumble. I love you still. My love stays the same. Let the Lord remind you of who you are in Him. I mean, what we sometimes, those of us who have children in our life, we know how much we love them unconditionally, but we kind of don't think about the Lord loving us like that unconditionally. His love is so great. We are so precious to Him. We're going to be with Him forever. We're going to be in a perfect place forever, have perfect joy forever. The place he designed us for. This is not the place he designed us for. He designed us to serve here, but not to be here forever. And there's something wrong with this place, even on your best days. There's something a little wrong. So identity first, who are you in Christ? That's a very important thing to study. And we're going to look at that in our worship service in Ephesians. Now, Jeremiah gets his first little word from the Lord, an almond branch, and the Lord speaks to him. Then the word of the Lord comes to him a second time. This is his second little vision. What do you see? And again, I think he sees this pot. He may have a vision. It's not important. But I think he actually sees a boiling pot when the Holy Spirit comes upon him and speaks to him. He says, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. So it's turning toward the south and it's boiling over. That's how they cook back then. That's how they cook meat and different things like that. So it'd be very natural for him to be along, walking along somewhere and see a boiling pot boiling over and kind of tilt it a little bit. And God says, you know what? Out of the north, disaster is going to come upon this land. Even in chapter one, he's already telling them. You're going to call them to repent. You're going to speak to them. But I'm already telling you right now, disaster is coming. Bad news. It says, out of the north, hey, I'm going to bring the tribes of the kingdoms of the north, which this is plural. And he talks about the kings setting up their thrones, plural. And as I was reading this, I was like, wait a minute. I thought it was just Nebuchadnezzar that came down until I started thinking about Babylon and how Nebuchadnezzar ran that nation. Okay, Babylon is not a nation. It's a city. It's like Rome is a city. It's a city state. So what they did out of their city is they went out and conquered. They conquered. And when they would conquer a king, if you were submissive and obedient and said, yes, Nebuchadnezzar, you can be my king, he would actually treat you okay. He, you might even get a seat at his table. Around his table, his dinner table, were multiple kings. Very smart. What better way to know how to administer a people and to govern a people than to have one of their legitimate kings sitting at your table? This happens to one of the Israelite kings who doesn't rebel, Jehoiachin. He gets actually to get a place at the table of Nebuchadnezzar. So I think Nebuchadnezzar here, according to Jeremiah 1, brings these guys with him. He incorporates their nations. He brings in their armies. He says, let's all do this together. If you want to submit to me, then let's go conquer Judah. They're rebelling against us. He includes them in. It's an incredible, incredibly smart leadership 
ability that he does. This is plural in the Hebrew. It's plural. Nations. Not just nation. Nations. Babylon was like Rome. Rome was an empire. Babylon spread out, conquered all these other nations, and Nebuchadnezzar brought them in. Now, if you rebelled against them like Zedekiah did, he killed you. Zedekiah, Nebuchadnezzar gave him a couple of chances, and Zedekiah just rebelled and rebelled. The last thing Zedekiah saw was his own sons being killed, and he plucked his eyes out. Pretty tough. And that man had been warned by Jeremiah. Submit to the Babylonians. Submit to them and you'll be okay. He wouldn't listen. He wouldn't listen to the Lord through Jeremiah. Listen to the false prophets instead. Do we have people out there listening to the false prophets? It's tough, right? Jesus said in the Bible, the Bible says there's been false prophets back then and there'll be false prophets in your time as well. You need to figure out who they are. You need to listen to the people who will tell you the truth, not tell you what you want to hear. He said they will set up their seat of government at the gates of Jerusalem. Does anybody know what the gates were, what they symbolized? That's where transactions occurred. That's where the, the government was, basically. He's basically telling them, you're going to lose your government here. Babylon is going to come govern you. Your government will now be wiped out because they're setting up their thrones in your gates, where the elders sat, where the things were transacted, where the government operated. So they are going to lose their kingdom. Why? Why is God handing over Israel, who he planted, who he created, who he gave the law through Moses and their laws for their country? Why is God wiping them out? He says right here, because of the evil you have done in forsaking me. You have adopted other countries' gods. And he warned them about this in the Old Testament. He said, if you do this, this is what I'm going to do to you. And God never breaks his word. If he says you're going to reap what you sow, you're going to reap what you sow. God told them, if you do this, this is what I'll do. They did it. He did it. He kept his word. He always does. Spend time in the word, y'all. God never breaks his word. Genesis to Revelation, it's all important. Some people have favorite books, but to me, I think to God, they're all equally important. Amen? They're all in the word. They all show us an aspect of who God is, how he operated in history. I don't think there's less important books in the Bible. They're very important, and we can bank our life and our soul upon it. We can build our life upon it. His truths, his promises, we need to put them into action in our life. Now, Jeremiah gets his first commission in the first half of chapter 1, but in the second half of chapter 1, he gets a second commission. Did you know that? So after he sees his second vision here, he gets a second commission. He says, but you, basically, literally, it says in Hebrew, gird up your loins, which means kind of get ready. Get, re get yourself ready. Um, get ready for action. Quit being complacent. You know, get ready to go. Get ready to serve me. Get your mind straight. I, I need to hear that a lot. Sometimes I'm just going through life and I'm just in a rut. I need to hear, wake up, look around you, serve me. There's people around you need ministry. They need you to do my will for them. You need, they need you to love them. They need you to share with them. They're everywhere. Uh, it's so easy to fall asleep. He tells Jeremiah, get yourself ready. Get ready to speak for me. Say whatever I tell you. Whatever I command you to say, say. And then he tells him something very interesting. He says, do not be dismayed by them or I will dismay you before them. Doesn't give you much of a choice here. Says, Jeremiah, you don't be afraid of these people. You need to totally lose the fear of man. If you don't, I'm going to dismay you. In other words, what I think he's saying here is, Jeremiah, you don't need to worry about these people people and what they think about you, you better worry about what I think of you. When we stand before the Lord, we die and stand before the Lord on Judgment Day, your mama and daddy and grandparents and aunts and uncles, your boss at work, they're not going to be on the throne. Your pastor is not going to be on the throne. Jesus Christ is going to be on the throne. He's the one we better worry about on Judgment Day. He's the one we better live in the light of. We better obey him. Well, everybody thinks on this. Who cares? Doesn't matter what they think. It matters what the Lord says about us. So we're being obedient to him and to him who more has been given, more will be expected and acquired of us. We don't need to worry about what people think about us. That should not even concern us in the least, especially when going and sharing the gospel with people, right? That's our big stronghold, right? The fear of man. He says, Jeremiah, if you fear them, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dismay you. You better worry about me, son. You better do what I say. We think we have a lot of problems, but... I hope you understand when I say this. Our biggest problem is our sin and the way we treat God and our obedience to Him. That's our biggest problem. Are we really focused on Him? Are we taking our sin too lightly? Are we doing what He's told us to do in His Word? Are we obeying His Holy Spirit? Are we even hearing the Holy Spirit speak to us and talk to us? You know, when I go a couple days and I, I don't witness to anybody, I start to look inside and think, you know, I'm not even hearing God speak to me about witnessing. Something's got to be wrong. 
because people are all around me. I know that. But I'm not even hearing his voice anymore. I'm so focused on getting my groceries, getting this, <laughs> mowing my yard, doing this, doing that, getting through work, that I get so self-centered and self-focused that I don't even hear his voice and I don't even see the people. He says, you go speak to them and say what I command and don't be dismayed by them. Not everyone is going to listen to you, Jeremiah. Jeremiah is going to be rejected a lot. I told you, most of the people in this generation will listen to you. And we're not called to go argue with people, but we are called to share the gospel with people, to share the good news, and they are listening. I'd probably say if you just go share the gospel with people, 98% of the people, maybe 99% of the people will listen to you. They'll at least listen. And many of them are interested. I'm telling you, this younger generation especially, they know nothing. They know nothing. They don't know the word. Most of them don't even have a Bible. So we need to go share the gospel, share tracts, share Bibles. We need to tell them about how great it is to have a relationship with the Lord. That's good news. I mean, think about it. If Jeremiah can be bold enough to not be afraid to proclaim bad news, God is going to judge you? Can't we be bold enough to go proclaim good news to people? Think about it. And I love this part here. He says, Jeremiah, today I have made you strong. Today I have made you. Today, a fortified city, an iron pillar and bronze wall. So stand against the whole land, everyone, the kings, the political leaders, the officials, those who serve the kings, the priests, the religious leaders, and the people of the land. In other words, everybody, Jeremiah, even if everybody is against you, I'm for you. And he says, Jeremiah, I've made you strong. I have made you a fortified city. I love the adjectives here. A pillar, a wall. He said, I have made you. There's a lot of fortified cities, cities with walls around them that are going to fall during Jeremiah's time, but not Jeremiah. A lot of fortified cities will be destroyed. Jeremiah's, he's not going to be destroyed. He's going to be strong through it all. Last week, we talked about how through our weakness, God is glorified, and through our weakness, the Lord makes us strong. Today, I like to talk about our strength the Lord. The Bible says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. If you have weakness, let God turn it into strength. And he often does that. God has not called us to be weak. He tells Jeremiah today, young man, today I have made you strong. Many of us, we've been walking with the Lord for decades and so we don't feel strong, but it's not what we think about ourselves. It's what God says about us, right? And he says, I have made you strong. Do you realize the strength that God has already given you inside? Do you recognize that? And I'm not talking about this like the false teachers like to talk about self-help and all that kind of stuff and you being strong. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the strength God has given you to glorify him, to do his will. You are a lot stronger than you think. Why? Because he's in you. He's made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, a bronze wall. What were the cities and the walls made of back then? Stone, right? But uh, iron and bronze, that's going to be a lot stronger than even the cities of the time. I told you, all these cities are going to fall, but not Jeremiah. And you're not going to fall either. When you're in the Lord, when you're with the Lord, when you're strong in him, everything can be going crazy around you, but not you. You're going to have peace. Now, what does this mean? That Jeremiah won't suffer? No. He says, they will fight against you, but they will not prevail against you because I am with you. And the meeting you go into, God is with you. And this place where you get anxious, God is with you. Jeremiah will be beaten up. There'll be plots to kill him. He'll be thrown in a cistern. He'll have to deal with false prophets who are lying to the people and saying, you're going to be okay. God's going to deliver you. You don't need to repent of your idolatry. Jeremiah is going to be ignored. He's going to be verbally assaulted. The New Testament says that all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There will be times where we are persecuted, but the fields are still ready for harvest and the workers are still few. So let's compare the times. Jeremiah is dealing with a people that have rebelled against God, God's own people. They don't want to hear it. They want to worship other gods. They don't love God. They're committing sexual immorality, adultery, turn their hearts away from God. They have, they are not into God. This generation is going to have to die off before God raises up a generation that will obey him. I don't want that to happen to our country. What is our country into? What are they into? Video games, sports, money, houses, lands. They're, they're into all this stuff. Even sometimes their own ministries can become idols, and that's easy to do. What is this nation really into? Food, barbecues, hanging out, chilling, drinking, alcohol. That's what they're into. What do you want to be into the rest of your life? From this point forward, what do you want to be your passion? You'll be like this world, wasting their time, wasting their life, or do you want to get into the Lord? The closer I get to the Lord, the less taste I have for the things of the world world. The more I, I just rather be with him and his people. I'd rather be praying. 
I'd rather be in the Word. I'd rather be in church. I'd rather be with people that are godly, fellowship. This other stuff is just things I used to enjoy. Oh, there's nothing inherently wrong with a lot of those things, but they're just not a passion anymore like they were. Let the Lord Jesus become your passion. Let Him consume more and more of your heart. Let that good news soak into you so you've got some good news to share with people. Know how good it is to be a child of God. Know how good it is to be able to worship God. Let God consume you with passion. And maybe we don't have to wait for this American generation to die off. Maybe we can turn this generation around with the Lord's help, with His power. But it starts when we turn ourselves around. When we start to realize, hey, I have wasted a lot of time in my life doing things that have absolutely no eternal significance. And instead of running to this thing to relax and to recuperate, let me run to this thing right here. Let me run to the Word. Let me run to His people. I'm telling you, there's nothing inherently wrong in a lot of these things I just mentioned. But when they become our passion and the things we run to, the things that drive us, working out, food, our house, all these things that everybody in the world lives for, sports, it's always something on sports, right? It's not as good as Jesus. Not, not even as good as Jesus. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your servant, Jeremiah. Thank you for his obedience to you. And I pray that whatever you said to him, you would say to us, Lord, that you have made us strong, that we are strong in you, and that we can stand against this whole land, and we can preach the good news, and we can release people from darkness by your power, that you have blessed us, Lord God, with spiritual authority in the heavenly realms. And that our prayers have power, and our life has power, because we are seated with you, Jesus, in the heavenly realm. Lord, wake us up and let us realize who we are. We are not weaklings. We are strong in you. Thank you that for our weakness that turns us to you. Thank you that you you glorified through our weakness, Lord. But you haven't called us just to be weak. You've called us to be strong in you. So let our prayers be strong. Let our spirits be strong. And let us be strong to love people, to care for people. Show us our sin, Lord. Forgive us when we make idols of things and get passionate about things that really don't matter. Just consume us with a passion for you. We need revival, Lord. Revive us. Show us areas of our life that need revival. Show us how we can turn to you. Revive our church. Revive our nation. Revive our city, Lord God. Revive us. Revive me, Lord God. Work in me. Do what you need to do in me. Give me a greater passion for you, Lord. A greater greater yearning for you. A greater fire for you, Lord. It's so easy for our fires to go out when we get involved in work, Lord, and we're so distracted from you and we're tired. Lord, just break through. Break through in our lives. Use us for your glory. When we are not at work just to do work, we are there to do ministry. We're there to serve you. Get us above the situation. Get us above the circumstances. Get us above this nation and all its problems and get us focused on you and your kingdom. Burn into our eyes, Lord God. Burn into our vision, judgment day and eternity. Let us live for eternal things. I thank you for each one in this room today. I thank you for your love for us. We're your beloved children, Lord. Help us to love you more, desire to know you more. Pour out your spirit on us, Lord. Help us to feel your presence and know you and obey you. Protect us from the evil one, Lord, and send revival to our hearts, God. So many people out there, they're wasting their lives, Lord. We don't want to waste our lives. We don't want to waste an hour of our life doing things that don't matter. Show us what's distracting us, Lord. Turn our hearts and our minds to you. We believe that you are a great God and you can do great things for your glory. And if we have to suffer for a little while, Lord, then we'll do that, Lord. But make us into what you want us to be. Rebuild us. Father, there's people in this room, myself included in some ways, who are broken. God, we need you to build us up. And we trust in you to do that. I know it's not going to happen overnight or instantly. We need you to build us up and strengthen us, Lord. And we know that you will. You have intended for us to be strong in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening. If this week's message helped you, feel free to share it with a friend. At Common Grounds, we are striving to help people grow in their faith and build community by finding common ground in Christ Jesus. Until next time, hope you all have a great week.